Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is, well, it's, it's not the PhD, uh, but that's the moniker I kind of run around in uh, on, online and, and in places. Uh, my real name is uh, John Heed Benid. Um, and uh, what I'm here to, I guess, talk to you about today is about how to uh, compile fast, run fast, run scale forever when you want to have an external language that's built into your uh, C++. And if you happen to use Lua, then you're going to want to use the library that I built called uh, Sol or Sol2. So uh, I guess I guess a little bit of history because people keep always asking me this, so it'd be good to have a video that point people back to it. Um, but why the PhD? Um, so it's actually a, a promise uh, on my future. Um, I want to get a doctorate. I want to go all the way through the academic uh, a ladder, um, and that's kind of a promise I made to myself very early on. And I kind of fought for scholarships and stuff like that's going to help me out, help me to do that. I'm going to be finished my undergrad in about a year, uh, and I'm kind of debating industry versus grad school. Kind of super leaning towards graduate school, but uh, you know. I've got time to uh, kind of be persuaded one way or the other. Um, but it, it doesn't act, it's not actually about like being a doctor. It actually stands for the Phantom Derp Storm. And it's because I'm really bad at video games. And so my uh, friends, you know, I had the moniker of the PhD, and then my friends, uh, you know, we were playing games together. And like, you're so bad at this. And so they called me Derp or Derp Storm. And then, you know, stuck Phantom in there to kind of fill it out. And then, you know, there you go, the PhD. And so I'm terrible at video games, and that's what it means. But you know, you guys know that, but nobody else is going to know that at least until not until the video comes out. So it'll be our secret. <laughs> um, so what is Lua? Uh, Lua is a small scripting language used in tons of places. Um, it's got databases like Redis's database uh, scripting language is Lua. Um, oh, whoops, sorry. Uh, the a bunch of operating system components actually use Lua as a scripting language, which I didn't think they would do, but they totally do. Um, game projects like that's how Lua got like super popular, right? You know, I think it was Tim Schafer picked it up for. Psychonauts or one of or one of his older games, and he used it, and that like galvanized the Lua, Lua's use in like the games industry. And now there's like a page and a page on Wikipedia that you just start, you just scroll forever about all the number of games that use it. Uh, famously used for World of Warcraft and all that. It's also used in high performance computing projects, which I didn't think people would do until I got a, a pool, uh, got an issue request with somebody asking me, "How do you I cite Sol2 in a scientific journal?" And I was like, "Why would you do that?" And he's like, "Oh, I'm using this HPX project, and it's been great to me, and so I'm going to cite this and legit and talk about my project." And I was like, "Wow, awesome!" Uh, it's also used in GUI scripting, so Waze, OpenMPT, um, chat servers, server management. That was actually some of the stuff I worked on. I worked on a chat server that served like 8,000 people at once from one machine. Uh, it was great. Um, and we used uh, Lua for that, and so on and so forth. Um, so what is Sol2? Um, it's a Lua to C++ binding library. Uh, it was started by Danny, uh, his online handle is Raps, uh, last name starts with Y. He's actually, he's, he is actually a doctor. Um, he's actually an oncologist. He does C++ for fun, but he's really good at it. Um, so like if I'm pretty sure that if he like decided to switch careers, like he would just be just as rich and just as amazing, uh, even as a doctor. Um, but he started Soul, um, and he kind of he kind of got it up to a certain point, and then kind of like stopped with it. And then I found it, and I picked it up. I didn't really have like a product or anything I was using it for. I just like liked the library, and I decided I'd go ham on it. So I did, and it turned into what it is now. Um, so the library is about uses C++ 14 and better. Um, before it used to be C++ 11, but I was using Visual Studio back in those days, and C++ 11 and Visual Studio in like 2013, 14 was like nightmare. Um, so uh, eventually, I kind of kept pushing it to be later and later as Visual Studio got better and better and as I finally got stopped getting less you know, internal compiler errors and crashes and everything else. Um, so it's written on top of the Lua C API, like most binding, binding libraries are, and it provides a C API compatibility layer, and it you know, has all these cool features that I'm going to talk about uh, coming up. Um, the library is established. As you just, I guess, heard from uh, Marcel here, um, they use it in production. Um, this is used in a lot of production places. I didn't believe it would actually be used in production in a lot of places, um, but it's actually used in the multiple arcade machine emulator. Um, it's used in for Chinese server farms. Don't ask me how I know that, uh, and like a bunch of other stuff. Um, so Sol2 has actually like become a library that's actually like industry ready, um, which I didn't think I'd ever be able to say about one of my own like I'm doing this for fun volunteer work libraries. But it's actually like industry ready and being used in industry, and people come to me and they talk to me about it. It's it's kind of great. Um, it's competed against, I guess, 20 other libraries. So this is not like Sol2 and Sol aren't like the first libraries to do this. There's been like a ton of other like binding libraries in-house and out and you know out in the wild where people have you know created a binding library for Lua. Um, and we managed to compete against those 20 plus libraries, and we've kind of survived, you know. And the other ones, the other ones that I've that used to be my main competitors have actually started to fall off a little bit, which I'm 
you know, it's sad to see them go, but like, uh, on the other hand, it's like, more market share, yes! Um, so we're pretty much great in all, at, all respects, except for the compilation speed, which is you know, something I'm actually going to be dealing with, I guess, as I work on the framework more, focusing more on compilation speed and uh, solving people's problems. We'll talk about some of those woes later. So we want to talk a little bit about the interface. What exactly would a good interface for Lua in C++ look like? Um, and one of the things I want to talk about is, is I guess, language parity. Um, Lua has all these constructs, you know, like tables, uh, strings, functions as like first class citizens and with like, with like a, a closures and all of that. Um, and of course, you know, all has numbers and strings and all that kind of fun stuff. Um, and so the idea here is that if you're going to embed a language in your other language, that, and that the, what you embed should look a lot like the language, the, your target scripting language, right? Um, if you create something that uses different idioms, people who pick up, you know, who come to your uh, framework and want to get really far with Lua, um, and they know Lua very well, but they don't know your framework very well, if you use different idioms, uh, it'll be very hard for them to pick up. Um, so it's always good for your framework to kind of match the language that you are uh, kind of trying to describe. And so I'm actually going to uh, show you a little bit um, here. So we can hit this and... So this is actually some uh, Lua code um, that, that I and some of us wrote. Uh, you can see here, you can have these tables here that are kind of initialized with like an open, uh, an open uh, curly brace. You can index things with numbers. Um, you have functions that can be like kind of namespaced. Uh, you can have, you know, and of course you can either declare on the top level, you can call them in the middle or, uh, you know, other things like that. <clears throat> Uh, and so, uh, you know, this is kind of what your Lua code looks like, right? Um, you have uh, for loops here for, you know, your, your typical iterations. Um, and, you know, obviously you have your, your, your if statements, your else statements, and, and all the other stuff uh, that uh, you can kind of do here. Um, and I kind of have some other, this is, this is kind of like a, a giant table that someone's making, right? So this is, kind of, again, this is kind of just giving you the feel of what Lua looks like and all of that. Um, and actually, I wonder if this this builds. Let's actually let's actually run this so you gotta see so you can see what people build with Lua and what other what I do. Okay. Uh here. Whoops. But yeah, this is actually and I think if I do this and I do this. Oops. Uh let me just uh reset. Sorry, two having two screens is like Jarring in many many ways, uh, but yeah. So this is um, right. It went back to the wrong screen. Um, so this is something that we made that I kind of made quickly uh, in Lua, um, and so so it's just breakout, right? So you you, you control paddles and all that, and you can uh, fire off uh, like balls and everything else, and you can get power ups and the cool stuff like that. So, but these are the you know the kinds of things that you you can make with Lua, and you know what the scripting and the scripting kind of affords you to get very far uh, in uh, uh, doing that. Um, <clears throat> so let's head back, and we're going to talk about, uh, and we're going to, I guess, kind of get into more of the soul stuff. So again, what would it look like, right? So I showed you some Lua code, and so this is what the kind of the C++ would look like, the kind of that would emulate this, right? We have this, this, this Lua object here. Right now, it's just it's some representation of like our, our embedded language, of our, our VM, of our scripting language. Um, and the idea is that, you know, you, as you saw in Lua, you could kind of index things by, by, by you know, number or by, you know, uh, string. Um, so we kind of wanted to emulate that here, right? Um, you, uh, we should be able to pull out things like, you know, numbers. We should be able to pull out things like functions, all using the same syntax, because that's what, again, Lua supports. Um, and we should also be able to call functions, you know, uh, you know m functions that represent, you know, functions that came from our vir the, the Lua virtual machine. Um, we also want to be able to support this kind of idea of multiple returns, right? So in Lua, multiple returns is like native in the language, right? You can return one, two, three, four, five, and you know, do a comma b comma c comma d comma e, and you can just set that equal to each other, and you know, you'll get five returns. So maybe emulate that a little bit of that magic over here by using like tuples or something, right? Pairs or tuples or other things like that. Um, we also want to be able to set things, right? So you have a table, you want to be able to kind of build things into it, right? Um, and here's another way, you know, where you kind of make a new table uh, and set it to the signals uh, type, and then you index in that signals type and like set, you know, 
like a lambda, right? A callable, right? That you want, you know, either your Lua code or, you know, through C++ through Lua and then back into C++ to call the code, right? You want that to be available. Um, and then this is kind of just like a, a, a quick way of saying, you know, hey, I want to run a script, right? That's just a string, right? So, you know, and we just have a test here, you know, if signal, then, you know, access the signals array that we set here, um, go to the first index, and then, you know, pass 20 into this thing, right? So this would call, you know, this would say beep with 20 um, instead of go taking the else branch, right? Uh, so this is kind of what we, uh, this is kind of the ideal uh, that we're looking for, right? Um, it looks a lot, it's, it's, it, looks, it looks like it's doable in C++. It's very much uh, reminiscent of the syntax that comes from Lua. So a person who is kind of just mucking around a little bit will still be able to get pretty far traction even if they don't read the, quite read the docs, right? They just see like a quick example and then they, they start trying to do stuff. Uh, we want them to kind of do stuff and have that do stuff that they do work. <laughs> um, so let's, let's, I guess, talk about how we make this happen. Um, so we're gonna talk about the, the, the pinching point here. Um, or I guess the place where we focus all of our effort into making this happen. Stacks. Uh, Lua C, C API is stack-based. Um, when you work with the C API, you have to push things onto its stack, um, push any other operands you want to a stack, call a function that does some operation, and then you, know, you get back a result on the stack or something else, right? Um, it is annoying to manage even when you understand it. Um, the other thing about it is that it defines interrupts for all of its primitive types, and then it provides, you know, like these two things for custom types. So it has primitives for numbers and integers if you use a late enough version of Lua, um, strings, tables, functions, and then you can go all the way to complex entities and custom types like uh, user data, light user data, uh, and I'll kind of explain what those terms mean a little bit later. So it's... Uh, it's good to use uh, for simple things, right? If you want to use a C API, and I have an example of like what the steps you would use to, in the C API to make this like Lua, make this Lua code happen in, in, C, in C or C++, right? So you want to get my table and you want to get the value A out of it, right? So you use Lua get global, you, uh, to, get the, to get a global variable um, out into your, your stack. So you, this time we're asked for my table because that's what we're asked for here. We use get field to say get the A field um, at negative one, and negative one in here is just counts from the top of the stack down. Um, so when you use negative numbers, we're saying you know the table on the top of the stack get A out of it, right? And so that's what we're doing. Um, and then you you know you retrieve the value out of that uh, thing that's that's left on the stack now. Um, so there's this uh, thing that we got out of the stack that, rep that represents my table and index into my table with A, and then we use Lua2 something to get the number, user data, string, whatever it is. Um, and so that's not too difficult, right? You know, it's three, three functions you have to call to kind of get a value out of Lua, um, minus, you know, some, some Lua pops for cleaning up your stack. Um, same thing here for, for calling a function my func with the uh, parameter 2. Uh, we get the global and we put it on top of the stack. We push a number uh, on top of that, and then we use this thing called do a p call, which uh, takes the number of arguments um, and uh, where takes the number of arguments and where it is uh, on the uh, uh, stack, and then calls your and basically pull, pops all of your arguments off the stack, and then call and then um, where, where the function is, it calls that function, um, and then of course you know when it returns, it fills your your stack with whatever return values, right? So you use Lua two x again, like you do here, to get your numbers, your users, your strings, your whatever, your tables. Um, and then you use Lua pop to, uh, you know, get rid of everything after you've inspected it or messed with it or done whatever you want with it. And so again, this isn't, this isn't too hard, right? Uh, not too complicated. Uh, then you want to do this. Um, so you want to call a function with the result of doubly indexing into my table, and you also want to use another parameter that is the result of my func2. This is a nightmare to do in the Lua C API. This doesn't scale. It's 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 a it's an absolute nightmare to make happen and make work. Um, it just does it just doesn't get anywhere. Um, so it, it kind of wastes you know your time as far as developing boilerplate for it, and it wastes your time as a developer because who wants to do who wants to figure out the CA, the CAP code calls to make that happen and arrange your stack nicely. Um, so we want to wrap that up right, and even if we didn't present this stuff to the user. Um, we, I needed this for my sanity when developing this um, because I wouldn't be able to handle it otherwise. Um, so I developed these kind of four or five functions here. Um, the most important, I guess, are the top, uh, are the top four. So we have soul stack get where we give it L, we give it an index and this record type here um, where it kind of keeps track of what we're doing with the stack. Um, and so what this does is this returns a type, the, the, uh, something re related to or 
uh, analogous to the type here that we pass in in the template parameter. Um, and so this will let us get type out of the stack, right? You know, at some index, right? For some definition of uh, whatever that means. Then we have push here where we, we you know, we give it the state that we have and uh, anything, right? So, you know, we throw in a number, we throw in a Boolean, we throw in a string, we throw in, you know, our own custom struct, whatever it is. Uh, this pushes it into Lua, right? That's its job. Um, and it returns to us, I guess, the number of things that we pushed onto the stack, right? So this helps us, you know, kind of keep things clean and everything. We also have a check method, and this is kind of for safety, right? You know, um, before we do a get, we kind of want to check that the thing that we're getting is like what we want, right? Because Luma is a dynamic language and we're interacting with the C API. It's got to be what we want it to be. Otherwise, we know Lua, Lua will more than happily let you alias and UB your way into a crash. Um, so you could call Lua2, you know, string on something that's not a string and it'll just hand you a null pointer and then you go use it and it explodes. And well, that's that. Um, so we, you need a checker to kind of like verify safety. And then we have a check get here. This isn't really like a special thing. This is an optimization. Its default implementation is just to call check. And if it succeeds, then call get. Um, but uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes Lua C API functions kind of conflate both. So if you do like Lua to number to get a number out of Lua, um, it will give you a, uh, it also has an out parameter for that basically tells you this is a number or it isn't, right? So there's some optimization potentials here. So if you're doing the check, we don't want to individually do the check, get the result, discard the result, and then do a get again where we actually get the result, right? That's a waste. Um, so this is just more, of, more or less an optimization. And the handler parameters here is like a, a handler, a panic handle that we call if, you know, we do a check and it's wrong, uh, then we just call your handler, right? And so this allows you to kind of, if you're using this low-level API, this allows you to insert your own kind of error handling, right? So, you know, you want to throw, you can throw. You want to, you know, standard terminate, you can terminate. Um, you know, stuff like that. Uh, and of course, I mean, you don't have to pass all of these. We default, like, things like the record and the handler. We default that for you, so you don't have to worry about it. But uh, if you do, you, you have access to it. And this final one here is a uh, stack Lua call. Um, and what this does is you pass it a, some type of callable from C++ or some type of invocable is the standard ease term. Um, and you can extra arguments that you want to tack to it. And basically what this does is it uh, pulls arguments from the stack in Lua, um, gets them all in the right place, and then calls your uh, CPP callable, your invocable, with the things you just pulled off the stack, right? Um, so we do some magic here to make sure that CPP callable, that to like inspect CPP callable and get all of its arguments and like call, and call it correctly. Um, so, and we do it for member variables, we do it for member functions, we have to, there's a big list of like bind traits and everything we have to do to uh, get all the arguments and do some crazy stuff. So, but that's not, you know, that's kind of a too, too gross of an implementation detail. Um, and also we have these fixed interrupt points, right? So on top of having these functions here, all these functions kind of are defined in terms of this thing. And you'll see that uh, it's, they're basically just structs. And so we have getter, pusher, checker, and check getter, right? You know, they correspond to the, the functions, the function names. Um, they each have a dot get, dot push, dot check, and dot check get. Um, they're all usually implemented as static, but we always access them, access them as a, uh, as a member function, as if there were a member function on this, like after we create one of these structs, um, mostly because you are allowed to override this struct with your own specialization. And so, uh, you know, if you wanted to do some kind of stateful thing or whatever, um, we let you do that. Uh, so we always act, we don't do colon colon get uh, as a static, we do dot get. Um, but it doesn't really matter as far as performance goes because uh, if you, you can access a static member function or a static function on, on a class using the dot uh, syntax um, and the optimizer will just know that it's, um, that it's a static function and you won't like, you know, do any crazy, uh, it won't like force you to go through the, the member syntax or anything like that. <clears throat> And so a Lua, as you can imagine, Lua call uses basically all of these to basically to get the arguments from, from the Lua stack and put them in the right order for your CP callable and then call the thing. Um, so these are the interop points that we kind of we defined. Um, and they're very useful because uh, scalability kind of requires some of these defaults. So C++ has a lot more than integers, floating point strings, functions, and table alikes, right? So you can create infinitely many types in C++ and you need to have a way that those map into Lua. Um, in some kind of sane defaulted way. Um, and so for any user defined type T, uh, we kind of treat it this as what's called a user data, which is just a blob of memory that Lua associates some semantics with. Um, and that'll come, and user data will come more in handy as we start talking about meta tables and ways to override uh, the behavior of your object in, the, in a Lua script. <clears throat> 
So some types are special. For, for example, I showed you that, uh, that like idealized code example in the beginning with that had tuple and, and things like that. Um, we specialize uh, the getter for things like tuple and pair um, so that you know, if there's uh, multiple returns, we kind of you know, uh, allow you to not only push multiple returns into Lua so that it comes out in the ABC syntax, right? So if you return a standard tuple, we automatically unpack it into ABC into Lua so that you can access each of the things. Um, and you do the same thing for pairs and, and those things as well. Um, we also have uh, uh, ways to uh, mess with vector list and map and all the other C++ containers. So um, there's two ways of kind of handling these. There's the expensive convert to table way. Um, and then there's the way where we store it as a user data. And then we kind of like set up this meta table where we make it feel like a table, even though it's not in Lua. Um, and so uh, ultimately, we actually chose the second option here because it's, uh, it's direct, it's faster. Um, it plays a little less, less nicely with the Lua ecosystem, um, but later versions of Lua introduced like nice, basically uh, uh, overrides and niceness into the system. So this, this is only a problem if you're using like Lua, an older version of Lua that came out in like 2005, like Lua 5.1, um, but uh, which you would be surprised how many people actually use that. Um, it's never going to die and it's very sad, but uh, we have to deal with it. Um, also, we have these you know, special strings from the standard, uh, W string, U16 string, U32 string, of course, I'm surprised if people want these types of work. Um, this is especially, I get a lot of issue requests, especially for people who work with uh, Win32, uh, and they obviously want either U16 and W strings, you know, so they can interact with the uh, Windows API. So uh, we do conversions on the fly for these. Um, and uh, Lua stores most of its strings as UTF-8. Um, so we kind of do conversions at the boundaries every time you pull out one of these or every time you push one of these in. Um, and there's some optimizations we do for that, but we won't talk about those. It's basically just we have a big static buffer that we use. Um, and it's great. <clears throat> uh, so this is essentially what we're doing, right? There's all this land in C++ and there's all this land in Lua, but we're shrinking it down, we're pinching it down. Everything goes through this box. Everything has to go through a get or check get or push or you know, use Lua call. Um, so it's, it's very uniform and it's based on type. So it's very easy to reason about, right? You know, if, I, if, you're, putting, if you're returning some type from a function, you know that you're going to call get. You know where you know where, where it's going to hit in uh, the specializations. So it's very easy to reason about. You know this is the behavior that this thing will have when I return it from my C++ function into Lua, and this is the behavior my thing will have when I stuff it into Lua from you know like a C++ function or something, right? <clears throat> and so now we we I, I kind of talked about some of the the the, the low level stuff. So now I need, we want to go higher than that, right? We need higher level abstractions because still people calling that stack API just isn't good enough. Um, so we built something called sole reference. And so basically this is our rule of zero type for our Lua bindings. And so the rule of zero was a, uh, a term coined by uh, R. Martino Fernandez, um, who actually was in the lounge. I, I spoke about you know, the, the lounge C++ place that I visited. He was from there and he actually coined this term and he made a blog post on Flaming Danger Zone, which is his blog. And it actually got picked up by Scott Myers in his book and all that, and it was great and wonderful. Um, but basically the rule of zero here is that we have a, uh, reference counting object for something that is taken from Lua. Um, and it's stored in the Lua registry, which is kind of this heap of memory that Lua m allocates for you to keep Lua objects alive. Um, it's a little bit slower than working with the stack, obviously, because you're taking the thing off the stack and putting it in this, like, heap, in this, uh, this pre-allocated heap uh, memory. But it is still pretty fast. Um, but, and it's also faster than you know, kind of performing serialization and all the other stuff. And so it's basically the Lua specific version of standard retain pointer, um, which is a up and coming like uh, reference counting uh, uh, control block type um, for for managing these things. Uh, that's being proposed actually. Uh, I think it's actually in the it's going to come in the new uh, wrapper school mailing list as well. So if you're interested in that kind of if you're interested in, uh, in an easy abstraction, so you don't have to kind of do this by re by yourself, which is I'm very interested because I don't want to keep implementing this thing over and over again um, when somebody else can do all the work for me. Um, that's the uh, that's the uh, proposal number right there. <clears throat> so here's our formula of success when we want to create some of the R of extractions, right? We derive from sole reference because it's our, it's our rule of zero, it's our RA, RAII type, right? Um, we, add, we don't really add any data to members, we just add functionality and type safety, and after that, uh, we profit. Um, so literally all of these abstractions that we have here um, are built on top of sole reference. So we have objects, we have tables, we have functions, threads, coroutines, state view, and state all of this built on top of this kind of all of these abstractions that we have. Um, and we don't, there's no like special data members or extra invariants we have to, we have to bookkeep here. Everything comes from sole reference. 
And so we could, all we have to do is we just kind of add member functions that do what people want us to do, right? So we have an is checker that allows us to check if, it's, if the type for this object is a T, and with an as that does a conversion for us if we want it. Um, we have table which does operator, uh, you know, operator access indexing. We have functions that override the operator call for calling in C++. We have threads that encapsulate, encapsulate a Lua thread, which isn't actually like a, uh, which isn't like a C++ thread. It's just like separate stack space so you can run your coroutines on them. Um, that's what those are. Um, we have coroutines, which, you know, again, are this, these ideas of like continue, uh, functions that you can kind of yield and, and pause and continue and stuff like that. Um, we have state view, which is, isn't exactly derived from soul, uh, soul reference, but it keeps some soul tables on the inside so we have easy access to the registry and globals. Um, so anytime you see that like Lua um, open bracket uh, in like a string to get something, that's using this, that's using uh, this here, um, where we, 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 get, we go to the global table when they do that syntax and we start, you know, basically doing the operations that they want. Yes? Is state view immutable? Uh, yes, everything about Lua is mutable. So state view is probably the wrong word, but I don't think state spam was a good word for it either. So I, state view kind of encapsulated more or less what I wanted to, to say about it. It's kind of a cheap look at the state and it's, it's again, state ref. state ref actually might've been a better term, um, but I am three years into using this and uh, <laughs> breaking changes are difficult. <laughs> um, Though actually, Soul Three will have some breaking changes in it, so I might I might just like break everybody all at once. Yes. Is uh, your object kind of like standard ini underneath? Like it can literally hold anything. Yeah, it, it can literally hold anything, and so it it can even hold like nothing. Um, and so you can do is and ash checks to kind of do that. And so this is useful for uh, a, this is useful for APIs where um, you see because again, C is plus is a very statically typed language, right? So say you want say you have a branch and you want to return a string in one case or a number in the other, right? Well, if you return a sole object, you can construct the object. It'll put it in this nice, you know, type arrays container that's mimicked in Lua, and it'll just get pushed right into Lua, and everything will be very safe and nice and happy. Um, and so that's what object is, right? So it's this kind of type arrays generic any object that for anything that comes from Lua. Yeah. Have you gone to the level of doing like small object optimization? Oh no. So when we store these things, um, it's it's ephemeral, right? So when we when you store something or get something as a an object, we're always doing the serialization to and from the type. Um, and that sounds terrible. I know it sounds terrible um, to start, but there are some things that I'm going to show you later about how we mitigate that um, and uh, make it so that uh, it, that's not a problem. Um, yeah. So don't worry. Yes. Uh, when you said that it's a type erase wrapper, did you mean that it was it behaved like the value type in C++? That it was a copy. It would actually copy in one name. Uh, yes, yeah, so it does copy. So the the thing about uh, soul object and the uh, and the soul reference that kind of backs it, um, it's just it's a it's a reference counter plus like the state that it comes from, and that's it. So these all things have reference semantics. Yeah, these all these things have complete reference semantics, right? So you copy them, it, it bumps up the. Uh, that's why that's why I said it's like retain pointer. I should have explained what retain pointer was. You copy it, it bumps up the reference count. You destruct it, it decre decrements the reference count. You move it, it moves, it steals the guts, that kind of stuff, right? So okay, it's so it's. it's yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. I just wanted to know. Yeah. I just. I, yeah. I should, you know. Just making that. Making that. I guess specific. <clears throat> All right. So these are kind of the base things, and now we're going to talk about the magical abstraction that we kind of sprinkle on top of this, right? All the all the fun stuff that really makes uh, Soul Two feel like Soul Two. So tables in the proxy operator, right? So we want to index into a table, you know, Bark and Wolf, right? Um, and we want to access my table. <clears throat> uh, and so we define this operator, and what we do is. Uh, we basically uh, keep perpetually creating a proxy type every time you access it. So we take the key, we store the key that you gave us. Um, in the case of like a C string, we store like a const car pointer. Um, and uh, we uh, basically have a, like a rolling perpetual like standard tuple kind of type that just keeps storing more and more keys uh, as you go along. <clears throat> And so one of the things I guess I want to mention here is that my table here uh, is, uh, can represent multiple things. So <clears throat> for example, uh, we have like state view and state here, which kind of have the globals in the registry. So there are some additional optimization we can get here because uh, this Lua C API has different calls for like getting it out of global and like generically accessing a table. And those have different performance characteristics. In fact, there's, there's a wide performance characteristic gap. Um, and so picking the right one or the wrong one changes the performance characteristics. 
but it does give you the same result, right? You know, you can act. So there's two basically two ways to do certain things in Lua, and so it kind of just like it's an API trap by the C API, right? Um, if you're getting globals and if you're getting a global, but you go through like the slow uh, push the table, push the global table on the stack, get access to the table on the stack, and then get your value, it's a lot slower than saying get global in this thing. Um, so it's a bit of an API trap in, in in that sense, right? That Lua pushed that. Uh, Lua, Lua C API pushed that kind of burden on you to implement and make sure that's fast, rather than you know uh, handling it handling it themselves. Um, so we have to kind of account for that when we do these kinds of uh, crazy indexing things. <clears throat> so operator, as I kind of said before, it lazily concatenates and saves keys, generating a new proxy type, um, and it's one basically one tuple entry per operator uh, access lookup. And so kind of as an example down here, um, you know, we do woof bark and one. And so the actual type for this is like a proxy of a global table into the, with a const that gets accessed by a const car, another const car, and an integer. So it's basically super lazy all the way, right? It's, it's almost like expression templates, but kind of not really. Um, and the only time we commit anything is when you actually like try to inspect the value. So if you say double value equals x, then we do a get and we pull out the value of a double, right? Um, or if you set it uh, and you say we set it to the string, um, then we do like we do the full get the table, get the table, and then write into the last table, write into the the woof the bark table at index one with the value woof, right? Okay, does that make sense? Yes. Is the converted operator explicit or implicit? Uh, everything's implicit. Um, reason I chose to do this do this implicitly is because. Uh, it's nicer, and that's literally the only reason. Um, if we make it explicit, then people have to do dot get. I mean, there are dot get and dot as, so you can be explicit if you really want to. Um, but I found that what double value will still work. It's just a double implicit. What do you mean? So it's a converting operator, right? It, it still works. Uh, mm, oh, oh, so I'm sorry, sorry, I'm sorry. Wait, I'm sorry. So when you when you were making, I'm sorry. So the question was. Uh, if you have um, a, are these operators marked explicit, right? So I accidentally interpret that question as, do I force people to explicitly like access the thing? No. So I don't mark any of the operators as explicit. Uh, no. Um, which, uh, again, I I don't think I necessarily need to, um, and it hasn't really uh, cost me much to not. Um, I haven't really looked into the design where I do qualify my conversion operators with explicit. Um, I might have to look into that later, um, but. Uh, this is kind of the design I kind of went rolled with. Uh, yes. Is this laziness of the, when you're writing in Lua? Does it do that, or is that just something you're doing? Like this is something I'm doing on on my own to kind of uh, give the appearance. Lua is not lazy this way. Yeah, Lua isn't lazy this way. Um, it will, you know, if you if you say, you know, yeah. if you ask for woof and bark, it will get woof and bark immediately. Yeah. Um, but the the thing here is is that uh, I kind of this this laziness becomes. Uh, necessary, and uh, I'll kind of show why it becomes necessary when we start talking about safety and stuff. Yes. Uh, does does this mean that you're accessing the table under woof, and then a separate table under bark, and then a separate table under one, or do you want tables just sort of flattened? Uh, I'm maxing separate tables each time, okay. um, so I have to dig into each table every time. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what that's about. So does everybody understand this? Yeah, really good? but there's an alternate design that you could literally construct a woof dot bar dot one key, and right. that would be in the same table, which would also make sense. And you know, right. I was wondering if that was the way. right. So uh, the the there are actually other uh, libraries that, and so the question was, you know, I uh, the comment was that I could like do something like construct like a woof dot bark dot one as far as like an accessor syntax. Um, but there are other libraries that do that, um, and it actually uh, costs them because Lua doesn't actually sub doesn't actually understand that syntax when you pass like a string to get something. So uh, it costs you to do the parsing on that yourself. Um, so it it's sort of and I, I, when I show you the benchmarks, I think I'll be able to point out which frameworks kind of do that and why it explodes. Um, so actually, I'm going to kind of show you, I guess, a little bit of the uh, that is not the button I wanted to press. Um, show you a little bit of the. Uh, uh, code here for a proxy. Oh, man. I need to take this over here because I can't see. There we go. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and we need to go here and here. Um, so the proxy type, uh, as we have it, and can, everybody can read this, can see this? Yeah, the main bit. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah uh, the license. Um, so we actually have this, this kind of, these are, again, implicit conversion operators. And we kind of have this, like, a, all this SFINA and stuff going on here for these these various uh, different kinds of um, uh, types. 
Um, and so it looks, again, it looks, the S5A goes on for, for a while, right? It's, there's a lot of uh, checking if it's a primitive, if it's not a string constructible, you know, it's all like that. And then we have to kind of have opposite conditions so we can have both these exist in the same space without exploding. Um, and it's very complicated. So I'm going to kind of spend a little bit of, a, of time explaining why we have to do uh, that looniness um, with these, uh, with the types. <clears throat> Let me move this easier. Okay, I didn't go backwards. Um, so let's, I guess, uh, kind of break it down. So what was all that for? So here's a simple case, right, for kind of enabling this magic conversion abstraction. Um, this is an int proxy, right? And we have an implicit conversion operator to int. And this is the syntax you use, and this just automatically dumps this out into, dumps out an integer whenever you kind of uh, check it, right? If you try to convert to like a cons car star or something, right, it'll, it'll just, you know, get an error. We can't convert to this type, right? <clears throat> so with that in mind, uh, we decide to make a unicorn proxy, this magical proxy type that just, you, we run any arbitrary code in here, and we just return whatever we need, right? You know, that's just what we want. Um, so we get these integers, and we get, the, you know, these, con and we can have a const car star here, and it all just converts, and it's great, and happy, yay. Um, there is a pitfall with this, though. And the pitfall that destroys our unicorn, poor unicorn, um, is things like uh, stood tie. And I probably shouldn't be there. Um, but things like stood tie. And it explodes because when you try to return something that has references inside of it, um, that doesn't like, you can't propagate that past, you know, the, uh, uh, you can't propagate that past outside of this, this operator T here. Um, so if you have a standard tuple of an int ref and an int ref, you can't construct that standard tuple with an int ref and int ref and then return it properly to this, right? Standard tie kind of works on the assumption that you're going to return a tuple that has a bunch of value types in it and it will just individually set, uh, it'll each individually assign through each element of the tuple to, to the other and that's how you kind of get that magical uh, standard tie multiple return type thing. This fails this and this causes us a lot of problems that we have to kind of get around in magical ways. <clears throat> Yes, the structured bindings also have the same problem, and it drives me up the wall, and I can't fix it because the language literally doesn't let me fix it. Um, so I actually, uh, yeah, I'll try to fix slide, yes. Do you do one of those wacky do your own get things to get around it, or? Sort of, sort of, sort of. So, so, yeah, right, so uh, actually, I mean, I, I mean, you wouldn't, but, but I would. Um, so. Right, and so that's part of the problem. So you, so you have to write your own tie and your own get, which is, or you have to write your own get that you then like default to the standard tuple one so you don't like waste implementation time trying to re-implement all that. But uh, yeah, so this explodes uh, horribly. Um, and so the left hand side is, it, the left hand side is basically, it, it rules, it's, it's, it's supreme over all that, right? So the implicit curve R take the left hand side as it is exactly, right? So it'll, it'll preserve all the references, it'll preserve, you know, whatever is in your like tuple or whatever else, right? And you can't really change that. Um, and so again, like I said, you can't return like a reference to something that's not like already like living in memory, right? So if you try to create a, you know, Lua uh, returns its, its numbers and things like that as, as values, right? So I can't take a reference to an integer that, you know, Lua's giving, that Lua, the C API hands me as a value, right? Yes. Oh, never mind, I just figured it Okay, <laughs> yeah. Also, so you cannot SFA, you, you cannot SFA or change the return type yeah. in, in its fullness, right? So. The type T that you see on the operator um, on this is like special. Like you can't like wrap it, you can't like put like special like code around here to like change what this returns. It always goes to the a return type, to, the, to what's on the left hand side. But you can do a little bit of change based on like T, you know, T reference and T, uh, and, and T um, as just like a value. Um, so you can, you can make a difference between choosing between a reference and a value. Um, and you can also, if you do enough SFINA, like I showed you in that complicated, you know, uh, piece of code, um, you can kind of disqualify certain things entirely, right? So I had my own conversion operator for standard string at the top, and that was because uh, if you left, if you left standard, if you put like a standard string here, um, it would like choke up completely because it would like say that, oh, I need to construct a kind of string from these multiple structures I have. Well, constcar star is a good match. So is standard string. So is this other thing. So is this other thing. And so it'll just blow up on you because it just can't figure out what the overload is. Um, so uh, that's why I had to, uh, not only did I have to like have like, you know, is primitive checks and all of that, but I also had to say is string constructible as part of like the, uh, the substitution failure is not an error stuff I was doing. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, Thing and implicitly invoke 
Yes, and so that's actually the advice I gave people, like just static cache like standard tuple or whatever, whatever they needed, and then okay. it would sort of work. But you know, again, that's not very expressive and all that fun stuff, right? We're we're going for magic here. That's what we're here for. Um, so, you know. Uh, Right. So, and 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 we, we do have that thing, right? Um. So, but but I think uh, one of the things I actually think I'm going to propose to standard soon is the ability to have your own return type, right? So T will be reduced as it always is from the left hand side, but then you can insert like a type here that would say like return this, you know, even though even though you're asked for this expression, I'm going to return like an integer anyway, right? Whoa, yeah, I'm not sure. And this, see, I because I, I I had this idea like three years ago. I'm not sure how well it'll fly, but again, the I, I'm I I have I'm a little hopeful because it's like a completely opt-in, right? Like this this wouldn't compile right now, right? It will not fly because it's not a Steven put in there. It does not. Make it work. Yeah, I mean the I'm just really worried that it will cause things to break in unexpected ways. Uh well when you use it. Right. So I think but the the thing the thing is, is that this isn't like valid syntax now, so it won't break. I know it won't break old code. Is is my idea? But you know, it might have funky interactions when you uh, use it, like in the new. Uh, yes. Yeah, it, it, it'll work a little bit like operator arrow does now. Well, it, it, okay. it ends up chaining. Right. So, so the the idea is that you know, I would if if you did have this case where um, you had standard tie, I could change the return. I could you know. Uh, specifically, like decay or unqualify each of the individual tuple elements, and then return my own tuple that is exactly what standard tie or, or structured binding would expect. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. Uh, I am not entirely sure that's the case because it's the whole point of operator t is that you find the function that gives you a return type of t. If you don't have one, mm -hmm. no template will match. Like you will just spinay out and do nothing. Like well, this no, is change our idea of the intent of it. Yeah. That operator T becomes the function that will give me something convertible yeah, to T. It's convertible. Yeah. It's a convertible so, operator. Uh, right. How, how, do you, so, how, do you, how do you kill deductions? Like how do you select the most? <laughs> we don't have to solve this. Yeah, well, 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 yeah, right. So so uh, you can, like, for different functions of so for 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 the video that that we're for the video that we're watching I guess right now um we're we're kind of bike shedding if you know how effective this would be and so you know I think that this would be a great conversation to have but we'll have to have it like after because I need to right. I got a lot of slides <laughs> I got a lot of slides um yeah um uh so the other thing right is that the other kind of proxy that we have is like a function result right it's just, it's just this type it's another kind of proxy that has you know the same issues so you can't standard tie and all that stuff right so again you know, we have standard tie here we try to call this function and of course you know we have this int ref int ref return that just explodes so we have a sole tie here that uh, kind of changes a little bit of the semantics right but does the right thing and so you it, comp it has custom expansion as a uh, uh, customized operator equal um, so it assigns properly and all the a and b get updated properly um, so that's kind of my answer to standard tie right now. Um, so I, I mean, I did like uh, like uh, Lisa had mentioned before. I kind of did go the the hacky terrible route. Um, I, I don't know. I kind of like doing this stuff, so why not? <clears throat> so uh, user types. Um, user types are things uh, are basically everything that's not currently recognized by the system, right? So number strings, functions, and all of that, like stood, stood function, all of that have like getters and pushers and all of that that correspond to their Lua uh, types, right? Then there's this 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 badlands basically of user data where you can do whatever you want with them. Um, and so what I decided is I was going to map all structs that didn't like weren't implicitly convertible down into this kind of like special uh, thing. Um, so for that I actually have a demo. Uh, so I, just, I can actually read this now. So close. There we go. Um, so you know here we've we're we're I'm going to just kind of give you a crash course in the library, right? Uh, we have checked this sole check arbitrary thing is just for safety. Um, so you define it and you get all the safety forever and ever. Um, IO streams because we're going to be printing stuff. And then we have the struct ship, right? You know, and we got bullets, we got life. You know, this is like gamey kind of thing, gamey kind of example, right? Um, because people need these because uh, if I don't have them, they'll be very confused and ask me why my thing isn't game friendly. Um, but here, so, you know, we have a function to hurt if we get hurt. And we have a, a Boolean that says if we shoot. So if we have bullets, we shoot and we turn true because we shot stuff. Uh, and if not, we can't shoot, it was false, and you know, that's horrible. Um, 
And so these, I have like a million of these examples, um, and this all goes in the documentation. This is actually, all of this actually gets compiled as part of my CI. So my examples and my tutorials and everything else always have to compile, and if they don't, then my build fails, and everybody gets to see the big red tag that says my build is failing, and I feel ashamed for a little bit until I go fix it. Um, so here's this, the, the, the soul state thing I was talking about. Um, and so we just call it Lua like we have in all of our slides. Um, and we open some libraries, you know, we open the base library because we want to print stuff and, and stuff like that. Um, and so here's the, uh, the introduction of a thing called the user type, right? We say new user type, we give it the class that we're, we're making, and we give it a name that we want as we want it to show up in Lua, right? So um, when we program in Lua, ship will be the kind of anchorage type that represents our ship uh, class. Um, and we also, we, what you can do is you just kind of pa directly pass a bunch of stuff, right? So you can pass member variables or member functions, and you can pass member variables and uh, other things like that. <clears throat> and so this is kind of, you know, very lightweight, right? One of the things you'll notice here, though, is that there's no, like, uh, curly braces around like these pairs, right? And this is kind of a, a bad design thing that hurt that I needed to do in the, in the beginning, but turned out to be a very bad idea as far as scaling up went. Um, because what this basically is is a massive variadic like template, right? And I do all kinds of crazy stuff with it. Um, and so this is actually one of the biggest sources of compiler plane because I wrote this in first and I wasn't really doing anything crazy with it. I was like, oh, I made a little ship and yeah, yeah you know, I made a small toy program. And then people come along and they bind 250, 500 members with this thing and there, it goes like, you know, they have this massive variadic template that's like, it can't even fit in the, their debug info anymore. And the compiler is like dying trying to compile it all. It manages to, and you know, when they run it super fast, that's great, but you know, it's it's this massive kind of thing that kind of uh, doesn't scale very well as far as compiler time, right? So this was a great idea to get off the ground, not a great idea to stick with. And this is actually one of the primary things I have to change result three. Yes? What is your metaprogramming under the hood behind this look like? Because it's just a very uh, template of a thousand types. It's still going to be pretty fast as long as you're not doing anything with it. So here is the, here's the kicker. Um, when this all gets down to the, the, the base of it, um, so I pass this through like at least three functions. So there at there's, a, there's at least three, four, five functions that have all these types in it, all 1,000 types in it, so that's bad. Um, then I do a grave sin and I pack it all into a tuple. So I have a tuple of 1,000 elements, and that just kills everything. Yes, exactly, um, and that's where I get a lot of my bug reports. Some for MFCC, um, but you know, uh, I've, I've, you know, compilers nowadays actually have actually better at handling this. And so nobody has to, spec nobody so far has had to, on later compilers, nobody's had to specify F template depth, depth uh, like, you know, 2, 20, 48 or whatever. Um, so uh, that, so yeah, that was, so that was kind of it. But um, to kind of show, and that's kind of an alternate way of doing it where you can, it's still a variadic template and you're packet into this type and then you just set the user type. Um, it's same, same thing. Um, this is what the code looks like though. Uh, so you, it, we automatically create a new member for you know your constructor. If you have a default constructor, we automatically bake this thing in for you. Um, we can call member functions, so we use this colon syntax in Lua to call that. And basically, what this uh, what it uh, kind of destructures into is uh, uh, dot uh, shoot, and then uh, it calls it calls it with basically the member that you uh, put the colon on. Um, and so that's actually oh god, it made the string. Um, but uh, in Lua, the colon here is syntactic sugar that basically just turns into this. Um, and so that's kind of how they mock up member functions uh, in their language. Um, so it's kind of like, it's sort of like a, like a it's, it's just sugar and everything kind of goes through this syntax. And so it's kind of like a universal call syntax of a way of handling it. Um, let me get this out of the way. Um, you can also, uh, you know, we, so you can call these member functions and you can also access uh, member variables uh, you know, like you would kind of expect. Um, and so you can print out these things uh, and set them and change them and all that kind of stuff, right? So if we compile this, uh, it should totally work and not break and I won't feel bad, I hope. Uh, oh, I should have a breakpoint here so it doesn't like exit immediately. <laughs> yeah, it might be too, yeah, I was too fast. Okay, well, let's, let's do this again. Um, <clears throat> and you can see it still takes a while to compile even though I've already pre-compiled it. Uh, the horror. Um, so yeah. Uh, Right, the window showed up here because uh, this duplicate display. Um, and it's very tiny, but uh, you can see here that it prints out that we're not dead because we have life. Uh, we have 80 life left, and we have, you know, this many, uh, uh, we have that many bullet, we have uh, uh, that many uh, bullets left. Um, so basically this is all this, we take care of doing all the binding and, and, and stuff underneath, and so you can kind of just set types to have these uh, 
uh, properties on them. And we, there's other crazy things that we do uh, beyond just you know, setting user types and everything. We get uh, really, really creative with it. Um, <clears throat> so if I could show, that's not it, that's not it at all, all the way down. Uh, oh no, this is, like, this is not these examples. These are the examples. Um, and so we actually have some very crazy uh, examples that we do here. Uh, so for example, we, you can actually bind bit fields uh, to sol2 um, on a type. Uh, and what we do this is we do this by using functions and we have this thing called sol property um, where you can basically use functions to uh, behave like variables. Um, and so this, in this case what we do is we have a structure uh, up top here that is basically a bunch of bits. Um, and uh, we basically allow you to set those bits by using, you know, we, we created some bit library that basically does reads and writes with a function, and then we pack that into a property. And so every time you access uh, some of the stuff on these classes, uh, it correctly, you know, it uses the function to put things in the bit field, but you can access them in Lua like they're uh, a variable. And this was actually very important because uh, the, most, when I, the first time I actually figured out that the multiple arcade machine emulator was using my code was when I got a, a pull, or not a pull request, but an issue request about I can't bind bit fields to these like uh, low level like arcade you know memory things that we're using, um, and I was like, why are you trying to bind bit fields? And he says, oh, we're using this for multiple arcade machine. I'm like, oh, this really is kind of taking on a life of its own. Um, so we act. So actually, you know, I made this example to show them how to do it, and then I put this in my examples. And so a lot of the examples you see here actually kind of came from people who had issue requests and said, I want to use this feature. I want to do this crazy thing. And so I kind of showed them how to do it. Um, and so again, we have all these very like uh, very. There's a bunch of other things that you could do with you know user types and the crazy things. You can you can have initializers. You can have factories that you can cut, create your own custom destructors and all sorts of stuff. And it always obeys RAI. You can bind uh, smart pointers and other things like that. And we do a lot of crazy stuff. Uh, and it's all powered by a lot of lot of lot of template stuff with t tuples and all of that. And it gets a little bit expensive in the background, uh, which is why I kind of have to figure out how to fix it all um, for Soul 3, but uh, that's kind of some of the stuff we do. You shift to MY, there we go. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of what user types are and how we kind of handle them. Um, and just as, as an aside, you can take a struct that you haven't like bound as a user type and stuff it into Lua. And we'll kind of like, we'll kind of like losslessly transport it through the system for you. Um, so you won't, so you don't actually have to register every single type you're going to pass into uh, Soul too. Um, you can just kind of use things as uh, you can just use it as a transport layer as a blob, um, and it will. And the funny thing, and the great thing is, is that if you use it as a blob and you're using it as a blob for like 30 minutes, 30 minutes down the line, you can say, you know what, I want this as a user type, and you can register as a user type, and it will. And the blobs from before will pick up all the stuff that you registered, um, and so it will become immediately usable like a real user type, um, which is useful for if you want to do things like you know have a type that's available only for this duration of this function, um, and you kind of imbue it with these these properties, and then when like you know the your user is done using it, you kind of rip out all the properties on it. Um, and so this kind of you know, lets people do things like sandboxing and safety and things like that. <coughs> overloading. Um, so we do actually allow overloading in Sol2. Um, sort of was a bad idea when I started doing it because I didn't realize how hard it would be or what it would cost me. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, and there's, it's like famously apparently like a lot of language designers who like work on like C Sharp and stuff like that, they always tweet about like, you know, oh, like, you know, Getting the language right, you know, it's like five percent of the work, but like overloading took like the rest of the ninety to do, like get it, to get to get right. Um, actually, I remember what I was doing an internship. I was I had an internship at Microsoft, and STL showed me a little bit of the uh, of the code for the compiler, and he showed me the did you he showed me the dim the dimto.c file, which is did you mean that one? And it was like a mil it, I'm pretty sure that source file was over like fifty thousand lines of just like. The compiler hammering away at like conversions and everything to figure out like what did you actually mean uh, for like overloading and everything. Um, it's nuts. Uh, and then I decided I want some of that in my life, so I implemented overloading. Oh boy! So here's uh, some some quick code, right? They're all just declarations except for this one. It's the definition. Um, and I decided that I would allow this syntax, right? So so overload bark woof bork borf yip. And I have to pick the, and so you can, you know, give me this call. You say my class dot new true, and I'm supposed to pick the right one out of all these. And I have to do it fast because if it's not fast, then people will use it and then complain about it. And people did. Um, so I came up with something that is not the fastest. I know there's faster, but uh, we're gonna we're gonna simulate this, right? So they call f my class dot new and true, 
and it must match my class reference and bool, and it has an area of two, right? This is what I gotta, I gotta work with. Um, so first up, we're, we're just gonna do a linear scan, right? Bark, right? It's, it's got an area of one. You know, this isn't, this isn't what we want, right? Next, we kill everything that has an area of one. Because we passed in everything at, in this, and because all the signatures are compile time signatures, I know, all of, I know all of these args at compile time. So even though I do a runtime check to check for arity, I pass in to a standard integer sequence that the arity from this, which is a compile time value, shouldn't be allowed anymore. So I'm basically creating a, co uh, a compile time tree through recursive function calls of things I don't want. So immediately I strike out this and this, so I don't do any testing on it. I don't test its arity, I don't test its, I don't test the number, its arguments for anything like that. So it just immediately gets tricked out. So that's a massive improvement to time. Um, did anyone question? <laughs> okay, yeah, Jason's just agreeing with me, which is great. Um, we also do this for arity of four, um, and so because we know arity at a compile time, we can immediately knock that out too. But I mean, there's no more of arity four here, but if there were, we would just kind of call them right out. Um, now we have something that matches the arity. Um, and so really the only thing that we actually do start checking types on is things that matches the arity, right? So this drastically decreases the amount of like, are you this, 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 that we're doing. Um, so this has two arguments, it matches what we want, and it's great, we pick this one. And so that's how we kind of go through and do our overloading. Any questions about that? That makes sense? Great. Um, so there's some other things we could do here. Like, so for example, um, there might be multiple ones that have two arguments that have that aren't that don't match this exactly, and only one of them does. So what we could do is because we know the arguments at compile time um, of this function yip, uh, what I could do is I could also create like a rolling list of like uh, types that we've successfully checked. And so anything that matches, I could just skip doing that for like later checks, right? But that's like that's the amount of template you know shenanigans I'm not quite willing to commit to um, just yet, just yet. Um, Right, so now we, oh, question, yes? If you have ambiguity, do you get a compile time error? No, we do first matching, which is, it has its benefits and has drawbacks. So first matching allows us to do things like you're able to have a fallback function. So I have a type called sole variadic args, and so basically that just sucks up everything, right? And you can, uh, and it has some other features as well. So if you push that as the last one and nothing matches and you get to that last one, that'll just kind of match, right? And so. It would technically, it's an ambiguity if, if if you take that function and you put it in the list first, that one will always match, right? So technically, that's an, you know there are better matches, but we don't do we don't commit to like a full you know compile time you know these are all complete this is in a completely disjoint set of types, right? Yes. Um, the functions that you pass in. Yes. Uh, Oh no! They just it just that just breaks. I mean, so yes, you 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 can do that, and I, I was I what you you can what what so so what Odin recommended was that you know if this one of these or sorry he didn't he didn't recommend it, he just he tempted me with the possibility. That if the, one of these, if say if this was int arg equals you know zero, then uh, this could count as arity of having zero or one. And this this has this this issue request has come up a bunch of times. And I. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Next time a user asks me this, I'm saying it's not possible. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So so Jason's said he's going to tell the user it's not possible. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah. Right. But yeah. you, you can't do it with a function pointer because uh, the type's already baked in by the time you get here. Um, and it, and if, it, if it wasn't baked in, you would have to resolve it. Otherwise, there would be a compiler error here, right? So um, that's just part of the, part of the problem. Uh, yes, Lisa. Um, so th this is more f well, for everybody, I guess. Um, I'm wondering if there's a way to do a template that creates a class context with one function with, with one function in an overload set corresponding to each one of these things, and just resolve it by C++ rules. Right. Um, the answer is you'd have to do it for every possible UI type you would have be passing in, and you can't enumerate those in general. Yeah. yeah so it would be because of because Lua is like a very strictly runtime system, right? You'd have to still enumerate every all the types and not you wouldn't be able to kind of for but that's but that's sort of what we're getting at with this, right? You know, if I if I did the recommendation that I made before, which is where, you know, I I also start like accumulating compile time types that did match, then I can start knocking things off faster and faster until I get to what is essentially the right answer. Um, but again, I only really committed to like the arity shortcut. I didn't commit to accumulating types and like you know blaze, getting blazingly faster and faster until you know I'm I'm running so fast that I hit the right one immediately. Um, so uh, yeah, that's you know just the choice that I had to make. So safety, um, safety is optional, but not stood optional. Um, we're going to talk about why um, queries can be made safe. So this is a bunch of queries that you can make out of it, right? So you can manipulate the re memory directly if you pull out a type and it's like this class type, right? Um, and so if you take a reference or a pointer, we like give you like the memory directly. And if you screw with the memory, like it'll show up in the Lua VM like directly, uh, which is great. Um, you know, you can get functions and you can call, you know, functions and, but, but here's the thing, right? What if value doesn't exist, right? In the Lua VM, what if my object doesn't exist? What if any of this doesn't exist? Uh, then these would be errors, right? These would be pretty, uh, these would, well, these wouldn't be errors. These would be seg faults, um, which is terrible. Yeah. So. But here's the thing, right? It's fast if you do it this way, right? You know, we don't bake the safety in because there's a there is a class of people who need that speed. Um, like the people who do the HPS projects and all the other stuff. Um, they need the speed. They don't want safety baked into all these queries. Why are they using Lua then? <laughs> They're okay. So like these are people are researchers, right? So they don't want to commit to learning all of C plus plus, and they want to get they want to. Their goal isn't to make good software. The goal is to get their research out the door and publish the papers. So they're going to pick up Lua, they're going to pick up Squirrel, they'll pick up JavaScript, whatever they need to get their job done, right? So it's it's a matter of throughput and 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 you know uh, deliverables, right? And that's why they do that. Uh, yes, Jason. If I can interject on this, the key to doing using this correctly is to put the time critical stuff in C++. Use this for the group, and you can get very fast through this. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yes. Isn't, so, isn't safety just one unlikely branch? So like what, what would it matter? Why is it so? Uh, so we, if we were to put safety in there, we would have to do type checks. And so when, when I, when I, and when people use Lua, some people use it as a static library, but a lot of people use it as a dynamic library. So calling Lua functions inserts like a compiler barrier. The compiler can't see before or after that, right? It's a DLL call. So it could have side effects and everything else that it can't quite reason about. So when they call when so when I call when I just do a a simple check for one of these, I'm inserting a hard fence that the compiler can't see through. So there's no optimization around there. If you linked it as a static library and you know you did all that, and of course you know LTO and then LTO and link time code generation that Visual Studio does and all that, and yay, it's going to be great. But you know I and when I do my benchmarks, I also compile Lua as a DLL because I want it to insert the compile time fence uh, so that you know I'm only measuring like the cost of the framework raw, right? Um, so yeah, so these queries can be made safe. That was the point I was trying to make. These queries can be totally be made safe uh, by wrapping it in optional. And you'll see here that I use sole optional, not standard optional. I will semi rant about that later. Um, the reason I do this is because I do my class reference and I want to stick that in my optional. And there's very good reasons as to why I do this, right? Um, so when you ask for a reference, I specifically make sure the thing isn't nil. Nil is this kind of type in Lua that can, you know, just represents emptiness, right? Um, whereas if you ask for a pointer, if the object is nil, I will hand you nil, right? And, and I'll also hand you null pointer if you did directly serialize a, a, a null pointer for my object. Um, so it's it's about semantics, and it's about and one of the other things about is is about teachability, right? But as you can see here, you can kind of uh, uh, check for uh, use sole optional to kind of check all of these, right? And because again, we have this system where uh, the get, the get, the check get, and all of that are taking care of everything. Everything that's on the left-hand side immediately communicates to the system on the right-hand side 
check for safety every time you're diving in to check these things, right? Um, and so you can get un engaged and unengaged optionals uh, based on you know, whether the thing actually exists or not. Uh, yes, Jason. What if they actually expose an optional into the system window? How can, can we handle that here? What do you mean by expose an optional? Like Ah, okay. So, right, sort of like that, right? So, um, the question from, from, from Jason was, you know, if I have my own, uh, if the user creates their own optional type or wants to use stood optional or a sole optional, um, does this kind of does this kind of prevent them from doing that? And the answer is yes. I had to make a specialization for optional, so it kind of takes the power away from them to make their own like optional thing, right? Um, or to inject their own semantics. Now they could, of course, I mean, it's a header-only library, so they can go in and delete the code and then insert their own thing if they really want to. Um, or they could, you know, give me an issue request and tell me, you know, this is why I think we should change the semantics option. I, I, I mean, I've got, I've have over 600 issues, and there's only like four open. I've closed like everything. I'm very fast at that. So, uh, you know, I'd, I'd be more than happy to listen if somebody had like a, a suggestion about that. Um, but yeah, so this is how you get safety. And so to kind of uh, why standard option doesn't cut it. Um, for the reference case, I would have to use like a non-null t star struct and put that in the optional in order to get the semantics I want to like not check for, to basically avoid the nil check, right, and avoid the penalty that that incurs. GSL non-null is an alias, so it's not actually suitable for this case um, because it just disappears in the pile, and so I'm just getting a pointer and I'm back where I was before, right? Um, and plus the overhead for like making my own non-null struct and then putting it in an optional is like not okay, right? Um, because I, I can't specialize standard optional to like behave properly with my non-null. That's like not something I can do. Um, or I, I don't want to commit to that because you know what if they change it and you know oops my implementation's out of date. Uh, so I'd rather just kind of ship my own optional to get that kind of feeling. Um, plus, there's a lot of people who use who use boost optional and they try to take it to this framework. And I do have I do have a sole use boost like define that you can do to get boost in here. Um, and so a lot of people expect this to be like a thing that works. Um, and when I used it at optional and I found that it broke and I got like, you know, three issue requests in the same day. Like, why is this busted? I was like, oh, standard optional is terrible. Um, so, you know, it, it also breaks my library teaching, right? You know, I have one rule. If you want safety, just wrap X in an optional and that's it, you're done. I don't have to teach you about non-null. I don't tell you about any of these other crazy things you can do. You just use it. But if I used that optional, it would be, if you want safety, just wrap X in optional. Unless it's a reference, then you need to use dot, dot, dot. And I mean, I, I, you know, I, I, you know, we start getting the, the, you know, we start getting the uh, the West Cons rules, right? The spiral, right? You know, and then when does it end? You know, so not interested in stood optional. Totally interested in sole optional. And my fix for this is go. I'm going to I am going to fight somebody about this because it was in the paper before and they removed it. I have no idea why they removed it. And I think it was because somebody made a contrived example about a sign through for the optional, right? So if you assign, so if you do, if you have a sole optional of like int ref, and you you know you set it to a variable that exists, right? And then you do you know, my optional equals 12. Well, somebody's like, oh, well, you know, should that assign through to the thing, right? And so that became like a discussion and people uh, bike shed about that. And then, you know, rather than finish the bike shed, they was like, we don't have time. And they axed it from the optional paper, which was a really dumb idea. Because if you think about optional and having a sign through semantics on a reference type like this, that means that if the optional is unengaged, you have very little choices. You either terminate, you either throw, or you perform some kind of crazy UB. None of those are acceptable, which means that the example that if, if they had thought, just, if they had just extended that conversation a little bit more, they would have realized that, and that wouldn't have been an option on the table, and they wouldn't have axed this out of the standard in the first place. But they did. Uh, so that's where I am. Uh, yes? Yeah, so you tell us what you really think. <laughs> no, that is, that is what I really think. <laughs> optional should rebind for optional reference. It should rebind on assignment. It's the only same behavior. You don't allow R values to be assigned to the optional reference to prevent dangling lifetime issues, and you reduce internal boilerplate code that I and other people would have to do with std optional. Why you have star in an optional? Like if you want to assign to true to the thing, then star optional. Right, and that's and that's the thing, right? People they, they should have had that conversation, but they didn't. They they that example, that horrible example that somebody posted in like the the accumulator or whatever the discussion, they just tripped everybody up and everybody fell down and that was the end of it. This is like yes. Uh, yeah, uh, Michael, yes. Yeah. Maybe you should watch that talk. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, Michael. We probably want to move on. We actually argued about this subject the entire last week, or last year. Oh, 
Okay, well then I guess everybody's aware, that's great. Uh, stood promise soul, or what things are in the future for soul, basically. <clears throat> so, soul three, why? Uh, I'm gonna read you this quick quote. I had spent a whole day for, for moving my binding from two Lua++ plus plus to Lua soul two. I found my Xcode became very lag, and compile time is about 10 minutes, and I use about eight gigabyte heap, so I have to abandon Xcode for coding. I had spent another whole day for moving my binding from soul two to Kaguya, and the compile time is two to, two to, two to three seconds. Uh, I'm ashamed. Um, <laughs> right, so it is actually wrong, but I have gotten similar reports about this for something like Visual Studio 2015. 2017 doesn't have this problem because they revamped their engine and it's wonderful and it's great. Um, and the only fix for Visual Studio 2015 is you have to like define like if def IntelliSense, you know, don't include Soul 2 header end if, right? <laughs> and so that's how that's how that works in 2015. Uh, right. So, but this is what uh, this is why I want to do Soul 3, right? And so, because compile times matters. Um, the good thing about variant attempts is they lose absolutely zero information in, pro in uh, propagation, right? So I could propagate these things all the way down, right? And I perform some crazy optimizations to make it really fast and, I, and to slim down you know, what's actually gets stored in Lua, right? So if I detect that you pass me a lambda and that lambda uh, is convertible to like a function pointer version of itself, I will serialize the function pointer and not the lambda and throw the lambda away. Um, if you pass me a uh, member function pointer and, like a, uh, and the type that's supposed to bind with it, uh, or the, the object that's supposed to bind, the self object that's supposed to bind with it, I will take that, put that in a up value for the function, which is like this, this, uh, this function local storage, and then use that to call and serialize, to serialize and call the function. And a lot of things I do like, like that, right? And if I were to use like type erasure like a lot of other libraries do, uh, I would just kind of drop this problems on the floor and drop the storage on the floor. Um, yeah, uh, Jason, you had a question -ish? Well, I, was, I was just I'm thinking about your notion of dropping the root, uh, the lambda and just throw in the function kind of version of it. Yes. And I have chosen to not do that because I thought that that would lose an op, uh, optimization uh, possibility would be lost by the compiler further down when you actually go to execute the lambda, but I don't know if it's actually true I've never tested it. Well, the, 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 thing is, the thing is, right, so when you serialize, uh, I mean, it might be different like TriScript and other things, right, because the, cause the system it's in, but for uh, Lua, they, every single function gets serialized as what's called a Lua C function, which has a fixed signature. So everything takes this kind of barrier on it, right? So the compiler can't optimize through that in the first place, right? Because the Lua C function gets stuffed in Lua, and that goes through some inscrutable system that the compiler can't completely see through. So when you get it out on the other side, right, you're, you're better off having the function pointer than having to take the, you're not have to do the right thing, right, where you serialize that to a full user data and then pull that user data out and then get that user data and then finally call the lambda, right? So it's, it's a matter of space and, and, and uh, speed in that case, right? But for something like ChaiScript where like the engine is built in C++ and it understands some of these things, you can save that information directly and you know, you'll get all the savings, right? So that, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I believe everything you said. Having like a void plus pointer, pointer plus some other yeah, having like a void pointer off to the lambda that you like allocate and, and keep and all that stuff, right? Yeah, but well, it, it's 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 still interesting to to know. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, compile times matter. Um, and so I actually did. A, there was actually a small case study I did with this, right? So I have another function called create enumeration, right? Where you pass it like you know name. You know, press like name, value, name, value, name, value, right? And you create your own enumeration. And that was a variadic template too. Um, somebody created a very big enumeration and they passed it this thing in the compile time. I didn't, I didn't even put it in, a, I didn't put it in a, a tuple, but it was still like huge. Um, and so what I did is I, 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 I bit the bullet and so I said, if you pass me something that's convertible to a string view of enum plus the enumeration type as like a pair, um, I will use the initializer list. And so people started using that. And my, the compile times went way down. Um, and the performance was the same. It was the same because I ended up serializing into Lua, and it was just you know the string name plus the value. Um, and so there's some potential here for me using initialize list to do some of these things. And I've got some really crazy ideas that I don't think I will have time to talk about, or I might be able to talk about in like questions and whatnot. Um, but I do have to save the compiler performance. It, it is a must, and I will bleed users without it. Um, and I don't want to. I mean, even though I have a thousand stars in, it, and so it's wildly successful and it's used in industry and stuff like that. I don't want to bleed users that have that are have a very that are very conscious of the build debug uh, cycle that I have, which is very popular in game development. Right? I can't forsake those people it just in the name of you know maximum variadic template, you know super temp tuple craziness speed. You know. Um, 
So I have to remember those people, and I, I have a, quite a few ideas about how I would do this, and K. Balo or, or August, Augustine uh, has actually given me quite a few ideas on how I would do this and not lose performance. Yes? So I haven't done that because I was trying to avoid taking additional dependencies, right? Um, I, I remember at one point, I, at one point optional was like a dependency that was like in a submodule in my library, and that was like too much for people. Yeah. Like they like complained, like, why, why are you, you know, kind of thing. So I mean, what, what I, the way I solved it was I, you know, I, I built it in the soul, right? And so that became a problem. So if I, if I take like Odin's library and I like cram it into my, my thing, uh, then yeah, it'll be great, but you know. Um, yeah. Yeah. Still be const expert. It can even still be like a lot of that stuff. Just you know, for example, the use case where you want to construct it from a pack of elements that are not as long as the entire length of the tuple, and you want the rest of them to be default constructed. That probably won't be supported, right? Right. But uh, if you lock off a lot of the really, really compile time heavy stuff, you can save a lot. Yeah. On, on like, Right. So when you have to figure out which yeah. constructors are explicit and which ones aren't, you could yeah. just make them exactly. None of exactly. Right. So 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 yeah. To to repeat for for people watching the video, um, you can save a lot of performance if if you don't need like a fully con standards conforming tuple with explicit you know constructors and constructs and all that other fun stuff. Um, you can create your own tuple uh, that's just you know derives from a tag of str uh, a sh bunch of uh, tagged structs, and you'll get you know. Crazy performance. So that's actually something I might look into. Um, I was actually going to looking into just throwing out the tuple altogether and uh, using a uh, std vector of std byte and then alloc and then creating another std vector of like type erase things and then like stuffing the things in the std vector. Um, it was a crazy idea. Uh, yeah, uh, I'll know all that stuff at compile time, right? So the idea. All right, so uh, Jason made the point that you know uh, I could build those tables myself and and get a lot of the same performance, and so I will have to. I definitely have to look into. It. These are all things again I'm looking into for Soul Three um, to change the uh, the interface, the API a little bit, and get some of those performance back. Um, one of the other things that I, I can do is use if const expr. Um, the problem is that I'll lop off everybody. GCC seven or GCC six and below, I'll lose those users. Um, Claim three point nine and below, I'll lose those users, which that isn't much of a problem. Um, but I also lose everybody below Visual Studio 2015, 2017. So 2015 and below, I'll lose all those users if I use this. But I did some some basic testing, and so I have one of these really gnarly like uh, for serialization of functions. I have a tag dispatching uh, SFINA like 12 overloads, and then like some extra stuff. Right? It's it's very gnarly. It's very disgusting, and it caused a lot of compile time uh, crunch. Um, and I tested by moving all that tag dispatching into like three functions with like you know just if const expr and compile times went uh, or const, and they didn't go through the roof they went down they did not go through they went through the floor um, and so uh, this has a lot of things that I I really want to look into as far as using if const expr to kind of clean the performance a little bit um, so yeah this is one of the things I want to look into um, I also want to use the binary bloating bloat face so I have a lot of like temporary functions, because this was kind of from the legacy of like working with C++11. And when I say C++11, I mean like C++07, that was like what Visual Studio had at the time. Uh, so, um, you know, I want to use, I, I have like a bunch of like functions that just like do this one very specific thing. And it's like I create this whole function that has all these templates in it just to do this one very small thing that I could probably do better with cost or something else, right? So I want to use the, the, the Google's binary bloated McBlook face that to help tell me, you know, where are a lot of these instantiations and functions are coming, so I start slimming down binary size. Because another complaint is that my binary sizes are, you know, huge um, because they do all this thing. Now, if you use a release mode, it can trim out a lot of it, but some of it stuff it can't because you know I don't put in anonymous namespaces, so it can't prove that's only used like once or whatever. Um, so this is what I need to use um, because it is it's definitely enormous. I, I took a look once and it was um, not cool. Uh, <laughs> but the goal was runtime speed, right? So you know. I failed at compile time speeds when I made Sol 2, right? But did I get 
runtime speeds, right? So let's let's figure it out. Let's 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 uh that's that's you know that's all that matters, right? So these are benchmarks that I wrote. Uh, I'm going to increase the size. There we go. I mean, you don't have to read all that. That's just like me explaining the benchmarks and what I did and where you can find them. Uh, I actually made a new set of benchmarks that include more libraries in this. So right now I'm I'm doing like one, two, three. Four, five, six, seven. I do like 13 libraries right now. So the, the next iteration of this, I'm doing, I'm benchmarking against 16 different libraries. Um, so I take it very seriously that I'm on the top of this list. Uh, I need to be on the top of this list, right? Um, because if, if I'm not, then I'm, you know, I'm, you know, what was the point, right? Um, I need to prove that I, you know, I have very little or almost no overhead compared to plain C. Um, so this is for member function calls, right? And so you see the old soul, the soul one made by wraps and that I worked on a little bit. Uh, yeah, we were terrible. Um, Swig is right up there with everybody else. Luin, Teff is another one, Lua wrapper, and so we kind of go all the way down, right? Lua bind is actually pretty decent, uh, but one of the faster ones is Lura, um, the new soul, uh, OO Lua, because it's like, it has a macro based DSL, so it, like, it can, like, it does macros and they use templates behind those macros. Um, so it's a little bit difficult to use and it lacks some functionality, but it, it's fast. Uh, that's the point, right? Um, so remember, function calls are fast uh, for soul. Um, User data variable access. So the reason why half of these things show up as unsupported is that when you try to bind a member variable, it just turns it into a function in Lua. So you can't call it with like object.a. You have to do object colon a parentheses, you know, to get the call. So, you know, if you're just starting out, you don't really care what syntax you get, right? But if you have a very large Lua code base and you want to, you know, have member variables and you want to act like the tables that you've been using all this time, that becomes unacceptable, right? So this is why this is set. These are all set as unsupported, right? Um, so as you can see here, uh, old soul is blazingly fast with uh, user data variable access, and I know this because I, I did lots of optimizations to make that happen. So we uh, we're basically the same as we were before, which is great. Um, <clears throat> uh, many user data variable access. So what this tests is how good is your search, right? So if I bind 50 member variables uh, and I start calling them in random orders. Right? I, it's a fixed order, it's a random order, but it's fixed for the, the entirety of the benchmark. So everybody accesses everything in the same lookup order, right? So it's all fair across uh, things. Um, how badly do you suffer? I mean, you can see here, Lua and Tef tanks pretty hard. Um, Lua wrapper and, and all these kind of tank really hard. And we're still up here, right? But plain C, man, I, I, when I implement the plain C, I, I had the, the privilege of being able to like directly, you know, because, you know, with plain C, I basically implement it as if I was trying to do the fast thing possible, right? So I get to do all the, I, get, I, don't, I don't have the same constraints as I do when I use like Sol, when I have Sol2 and I have like this, this runtime system that I'm trying to manage, right? I just know exactly what I want to call. I do, you know, I just create a, a perfect hash map and then bam, you know, that's it, right? Um, if I could figure out how to get a more perfect hash map for Sol, I'd be able to reduce this uh, at least a little bit. Um, Though there were some improvements that were actually done after this benchmark was computed, uh, where if I use boost, so if you use boost and you say sole use boost, there when you look up uh, member variables and user data variables, there is a zero overhead. There's a zero allocation, zero overhead path because boost boost uh, maps support uh, using a different key and a different hash. So. I can pull out a string view, instead of serializing it into a string and then having to perform the lookup to do all of this, I can pull out a string view and say, listen, this string view and this hash function, this equality function are all compatible with the one that's in my map. So just use these to do, just use these to hash and compare and everything's going to be fine, right? And so I get a zero allocation, zero overhead uh, path. And the reason I found this out was because somebody put, put an issue open against my library saying, uh, hey, um, I use this in a critical audio thread. I'm noticing some allocations, I like that to stop. And so I said, well, if you use boost and you do this, and I, I went through, I used you know, soul, I have a defined soul compatible and ordered hash or whatever. Um, and if you turn that on, then uh, I don't do any allocations. So that might actually affect this benchmark a little bit. We might get fat a little bit faster and get a little bit closer to plain C, um, which would be fantastic. Because plain C stores everything as const car star, because it can, because you know it's, it's C. Uh, it knows that the memory's gonna stay there and I don't have to do anything about it, right? Some other things. Uh, C function through Lua, right? So if you bind a uh, C++ function uh, into some F, right, in Lua, and then you try to call that uh, function through Lua, what is the performance overhead? Um, I don't know what Lua CPP interface is doing here. I didn't step through their code. I have no idea what's going on. Um, but the rest of us, we're all doing pretty great. Uh, you know, and again, you, you, again, you can see the error bars here, which uh, represent the standard deviation. Um, and you know, the scatter plot here just kind of shows you the individual samples, right? So you kind of always get a full picture of what's going on. Um, 
And so as you can see, you know, we're extremely competitive here, right? And I mean, you know, even though it's even though theoretically we're faster than plain C by the median or the mean, um, which is within the error bar, right? You know, no, it's not a big deal. Um, stateful C functions. Uh, this is when you create a lambda and you put stuff in that lambda, so you can't do the Func the function pointer like convertibility thing, right? So you have to serialize it as stateful. Um, some functions fall, some things fall down on their face when you try to do that, like oh, Lua and Lua CP interface and Lua API PP because they have macros and other stuff that try to do it for you. Um, Lua is not having a good time here, but the rest of us are, are having a good time. And Sol is again up, up top there, which is great. Uh, this one confused me a little bit though because there seems to be a non integral performance difference here, and this confuses me. Um, I think I actually solved it in my next, in my like, latest series of benchmarks about what was going on. Um, so the numbers will be better, but we're all basically down here. That's, that's all you need to know, right? Um, and so this is for just calling a C function directly. Um, and you know, this is you know, pretty good performance. Uh, Lua, calling a Lua function inside C++, so you get an abstraction for Lua function, you call it. What does that look like here? Um, the reason old soul and soul get boost here is because we have an abstraction that uh, allows you to preemptively push the function onto the stack, and then you can do a bunch of function calls and work with it, and then you can pop it off later. Um, so plain C and a bunch of these other things, uh, you have to get the you get the type, and then you call it, and then you pop it off the stack, right? And then so it's to clean the stack nicely, right? So I might have meant the same thing for plain C because it's plain C and it can do literally it can do everything that the other things are doing, and so it feels a little bit dishonest to have it. Uh, uh, doing that right, so and I'll bump it up and make it like the others. Um, but Swig is actually ridiculously fast. This is the first time Swig is like actually showing up and to play. It's it's great. Um, they're doing a really good job here. Um, their 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 function abstraction are really good. I actually learned a couple things or two by looking at the the like a vomit of generated code they spit out here. Um, uh, whoops, that was not what I wanted. Absolutely unreadable. Uh, it took me forever. Yeah, uh, I have no idea how I did that. Um, so we're just going to continue on. <laughs> uh, all right, uh, multi-return, right? So this is where you try to serialize multiple things back into uh, C++. Um, a lot of fun a lot of uh, things don't support it. Um, Lua bind, though, down down here, Lua bind actually does support it, but Lua bind the library itself has died, and like Rasterbar, the subsite is gone, and like the people who vend Lua bind are like gone. So the only Remaining version of Luabind that's actually like mildly kept up to date is like Luabind deboostified by somebody who forked based the library and is working on it on his own, um, and he decided to kind of like gut support for that. I don't know why. Um, he just said, you know, I'm not, I'm not interested, and that was the end of that. Um, so yeah, Luabind does have support for vanilla Luabind, but you can't get vanilla Luabind anymore. So that's that's the end of that. Um, global get right. So this is what I was talking about where. Depending on how you use like the Lua get global versus Lua like get table and get field and all that stuff, right? The difference, right? You can see it here. Celine is tanking, Lua bind is tanking, even Lua CP interface has has a large amount of overhead, right? Compared to everybody else who uses the get global version, we're all very fast, right? So this is again, this is one of those API traps, right? So that's what that is about. <clears throat> and so yeah, there's there's more benchmarks, and you can it's on the web, you can view them, and it's all great and all that stuff. So now let's uh, just continue on. Last and most important thing, this, you know, I have 20 seconds, so I'm going to totally tell you this, the super important thing, I swear. Documentation, oh my god. Greetings, I used, I used to use Sol, but I could not figure out how it works, and thus quickly switched over to Selene, which you saw had terrible performance, but he still used it anyway. Since on its main page, it had a much better tutorial how-to manual. Documentation is awesome. It, you will bleed users if you don't have documentation. You need to have documentation. Get documentation. It's really great. Benchmarking those libraries was hell because so many of them didn't have documentation. So I'm trying to like figure out like why is your performance terrible and I just can't figure it out because they didn't document anything. So I have to like I have to get a debugger and I have to like step through their code and be like, oh, this is what they're doing. Oh wait, no, that's not what they're doing in this case. And ah, documentation. It's very good. Get it. It's great. I didn't have any and I lost users and everything. And like he says, like I think Soul has more features. It totally has more features, but I didn't let anyone know it had more features. So I just lost users. <laughs> the backbone of any product is your documentation. People, you know, some products are like the only alternative, right? So like the only product that does X. So people will muck through its APIs and class APIs and join IRC and, and do whatever it takes to understand it. But Sol2 has 20 plus competitors all doing their own bindings. I can't afford to like, oh, you know, no documentation, that's fine, right? It doesn't work that way. Got to have the docs. Got to have the docs, they're necessary. And we do have the docs and they're, they're beautiful. We have over like 100 samples, everything, all 100, all like 100 plus samples and like 50 plus examples and all that stuff 
all of that stuff gets compiled as CI, and you know, ev so every single sample that you see on the web page is compiled and it works and it runs. It's great. Have documentation. It's wonderful. All right, so a little bit of thanks and chilling. I guess I'm sort of biting into your guys' time, your break time a little bit, but I need to thank a few people. Um, support me and my family. There's a donation link at the bottom of the docs and then the README. Um, donations actually kept me fed for this trip. Uh, so thank you to all the people who've donated. Robert, uh, Russian person's name I can't pronounce, but his online handle is Orpheus Z. Um, Michael Waller, Elias Dallaire, and Johan Schultz. What? Orpheus. Orpheus. Oh. Yeah, but he's Russian though. How did he get a? That, that's not the that's the Cyrillic. Cyrillic. <laughs> <laughs> I will, I'm going. To, I'm going. To, I, I mean, he 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 comes to my disc, he comes to the Discord often, so I, I'll totally ask him how he ended up with the with the Greek name because he's he's in he's he's Russian. He's in Russia. He's working from Russia. How did that happen? Um, I'll have to ask him. Uh, my gratitude to Mark Zarin, who's who's here. Um, Simon Brand, who's not here. Um, they actually pushed me to apply as a student volunteer in the first place. I wasn't going to be here. Um, I had no intention of showing up. I wasn't going to, I, I think a long time ago I applied to CPCon and it didn't work out because I was doing weird things. I wanted to apply under my alias name only and they were like, be professional, get out of here. Um, yeah. So that didn't quite work out. And so I was like, ah, you know, I don't, I'm, I only want to be the PhD anywhere. I, I don't think I'll apply. Um, and so I didn't, uh, but Mark Zarin and Simon Brand both kind of, you know, talked to me a little bit and said, listen, you should apply. And they gave me words of encouragement. And, you know, those things are powerful. They, they really do help uh, people like me you know, kind of put our put our foot out there again. And also, Jason Turner, who's also here um, at Left Cus, uh, he spoke about Soul before I even ha ever had plans about like showing it to the world. Like he presented it somewhere, I believe at last year, last year. yeah, here last year. So he two years ago, and he, he presented about it, and like Soul to Soul to popularity like exploded overnight. I had no idea why this happened. <laughs> and then I then like later on, like somebody came around and I was like, oh yeah, did you know Jason Turner talking about? It? I was like, what? And I found his presentation. I was like, oh my God, he, he actually prays so too. Oh my God, I have, this can't be a toy project anymore. I, I'm responsible now. Ah, um, so he also really encouraged me to speak and I, and I finally got to meet him here and it was, it was wonderful and great. Um, you know, and I'm actually, I'm going to appear on CUP cast on Monday, May 21st, you know, permitting, you know, no hurricanes, tornadoes or anything happen. Um, I'm going to be on CUP cast and I'll also talk more about Soul 2 and, and the journey and all that fun stuff. Um, more gratitude. Uh, Hipponi, who's on the CFP link Slack, and Kaizo um, also helped me bike shed the new logo um, that you saw at the very beginning, um, that shiny new yellow logo with the, the, uh, the S looking uh, thing. I also want to thank uh, hashtag include because uh, they also kind of, you know, generally kind of supported me in, in, in kind of getting places and, and, you know, really opened my eyes to like the, that I wasn't the only one who kind of, you know, had these experiences where I felt like I was like the only alone and I was the only one, right? Um, so just sharing uh, and and being able for them to kind of assure me that, you know, even if I am different, that they will still accept me as just a human being and judge me on those merits uh, is a very refreshing thing when you kind of grow up the way I did. Um, I also want to thank the Lamp C++, you know, for always dragging me back onto this wonderful couch uh, and, you know, having, being amazing, there's a great sense of humor and, and all that stuff. Um, you know, the, the guys have been really, really great. So any questions, comments? Uh, these are this is my email, my Twitter, LinkedIn. Actually, you should totally go to that LinkedIn. I actually got the link, the PhD. You can find me on LinkedIn by saying slash in, <laughs> slash the PhD. It's great. Yeah, so that's, that's the talk. Thank you. <laughs> so any, I guess, any actual questions or did I totally answer them? Oh, yes. You, uh, you said that the backbone of the API is this reference concept. Yes. And with Is there a way in your library to actually serialize and deserialize things? And the reason I ask is one of the things that I like about Lua is everything's in the Lua state. So you right. have some like super multi-threaded event processor thing, each with its own interpreter. Right. And they can send messages to each other. How would I do that? So we don't uh, the serialization is through like the get and set and all that stuff. That's how you get the structs in and out. Um, we don't actually put it in any like binary format, so we don't have like JSON serialization or anything. But Elias Dallaire made something called meta stuff and he put like JSON serialization on top of Salt 2. And it wasn't like he came to me and he was like, this is a lot easier than I thought it would be. And I was like, yeah, that's the point. Um, so it's possible, right? You can uh, you can package things and ship them off to other places, right? Um, it's not 
Uh, you could do it if you have if you have access to the full C++ system. You can do that just by using the getters and setters and kind of ship them between each other. Or um, you can kind of serialize this into this format and then pipe it across, you know, a, a named pipe or whatever else is you're using to communicate between systems. Um, but yeah, that's like totally supported scenario. You're not going to have a it's not going to be a hell of a time. We don't have like a you know a deserialize all function, right? You know, we don't have that built in, but we have all the utilities to make that happen for you. Uh, One more question. Yes. Was that the new plot that had those? No, no, that was a GNU plot. Um, so that was actually Matplotlib. So I used a, f a benchmarking framework called Nunius, and Nunius actually has its own HTML charts, but I didn't quite like them because they didn't do, you know, they didn't do like the fancy scatter plot with the error bar and all that fun stuff. So um, I actually have an even better version. I can, you guys, you guys mind sticking around? And I, sh I can show you. Yeah. Uh, so I can totally show you the. Okay, so this is actually going to be my, my super secret blog. Like, don't tell anyone that this is like a thing yet. It's a video. Oh. Ah, uh, well, whatever. I mean, by, by the time the video, if, if my blog is not ready by the time the video goes out, I'm, I've, I failed. Um, I failed miserably. Um, I have no idea if I'm doing it. So, the github.io. And I can't tell if that's the right URL. I totally can. So this is actually my blog. I'm, I'm working on it. Name pending. I'm working on it. Uh, but if I go all the way down here, if the case for pointer pointer in the shared library. So this is actually another paper I want to write uh, that Mark Zarin actually inspired me to do. Um, I have shinier, more well-improved graphs, right? And so these ones I actually made, these ones are actually colorblind friendly, right? So in the hashtag, and this is why I like hashtag include, right? So I went to the hashtag include and I posted like early versions of this and they were like, this is a garbage graph if someone's colorblind. And I was like, probably right. And I was like, well, I wish I was, there was somebody colorblind here who could help me. And then the person who was like there was like, hi, I'm colorblind. And they helped me develop this, right? So there's like swatches and you know, it, it patterns the thing and the colors and you know it shows all the same stuff so uh, you know the graphs are actually going to look a lot prettier um, when I get the updated going. I actually I did finish doing all the benchmarking it's just that uh, I have to like re remap the tools a little bit to, pr to print these prettier graphs for all 16 frameworks. I'm never going to do that again. Um, yeah so uh, and again you know it was it's, it was thanks to the hashtag include discord uh, software bear and Seth and a bunch of other people who really helped me uh, uh, bike shed and make this uh, make these kind of really pretty pre graphs, yeah. All with Mat Matplotlib, right in Python. Um, so, and the code is going to be open source. So, if you want to look at you know what I do, um, all the code is also open source. Sol two, the old benchmarks library is open source, and the new benchmark library is also already open source. Um, I just need to push the Python changes. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, which license? MIT. It's all under MIT, but. I'm considering changing it, not to anything like commercial or anything, but uh, so I've heard of people who have MIT licensed software and they, uh, they accept pull requests from people, right, into their MIT licensed project. MIT license has no guarantees to protect you from people who push patented code into your thing. And if you're not smart enough to catch it and somebody creates a binary out of that, that person can be sued. Uh, and that person was sued and they got, you know, they got screwed by a patent troll, basically. Um, the software, the license that can protect you. So, so this isn't. It's not. It's not a bad thing for like a corporation. Right? And I've no like. I've had very few pull requests, and I've guarded the code, and it's, I've verified it's all mine. It's MIT. Great. Um, but the other license that will protect you from this is the Apache license. Any contribution that's made to you uh, de deprives the person who made the contribution the ability of claiming copyright or anything like that. Right. So it becomes part of your library formally. Um, and so Apache, Apache two helps you do that. Um, there might be a couple other library uh, licenses that help you do that. Um, but yeah, just something to keep in mind about the MIT license. I still use MIT because, you know, I'm pretty judicious about what code I accept and everything else, right? But uh, just keep that in mind. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, all right. Okay. Well, thank you.